a story, an origin point of knowledge that passed around the world and became the core of a, of a mystery that we're trying to figure out. And that mystery seems to lead back to Lake Vaughn and this lost era civilization. So what we're talking about today is a number of events, uh, discoveries, and uh, levels of consciousness that have made news in 2023. And I have uh, three friends with me today. I have Jen Dale, who is an archaeologist. Jen's been on the show quite a few times. She's quite a regular. Jen has a, a point of reference she's going to present to us. Jim Willis, author. Jim's been with us many times, author of American Cults, Hidden History, Ancient Gods, and so on and so forth. Jim seems to just, he can't put the pen down, and he's spinning out <laughs> books after books after book. And that's uh, that's uh, fantastic, and it's always great to see Jim. And then we have a friend, uh, Matt LaCroix. I haven't seen Matt probably in about seven or eight years, and I thought, i got to get Matt on the show. He's always rocking it. He's always got something unique to talk about. And it's Matt's good to be the author. <laughs> good to see you too. <laughs> Matt's the author of uh, the, uh, the Illusion of Us, uh, the Stage in Time. I think he was talking about the Stage in Time about five or seven years ago. He's got a new book coming out. We'll talk about that. And each of these uh, guests today have something unique to say, something to present to us that I find. Uh, compelling so hey welcome everybody great to see you and thanks for joining me here on earth ancients hey all jen good to be jim good Hello. to be with you cliff <laughs> uh so much to talk about i want to start with you jen this uh item that you brought up is in zimbabwe uh no Zam zombie zambia zambia thank zambia, you yeah, you yeah africa it. and i can see why you thought it was unique simply because it is so old. And I want you to yeah. talk a little bit about it. Give us kind of an overview. It's not just the fact that it is uh, the remains that are half a million years old. It's more than that, isn't it? Oh my gosh, yes. Because not only is it half a million years old, but it also tells us that this um, early hominid was actually building and had some pretty complex thinking in regards to, um, you know, solving problems that we don't often attribute to early humans. So, for instance, um, this was found along the riverbank in Zambia. And essentially what it is, is they're interlocking logs and they've been deliberately crafted um, to allow them to fit together, kind of think like that tongue and groove kind of um, building technique. And according to the, this new study that's just been put out, they were made by stone tools. They use stone tools, which again speaks to greater cognitive complexity. Um, it's so funny because, you know, I'm a huge, uh, I love Neanderthal. I'm not going to lie. I all, I love Neanderthal. I think they're hugely undervalued, and we often think of them as being kind of the dolt of the ancient world, when in reality, I think we've found, especially over the last couple of years, and I'm not insinuating that Neanderthal made this, but I, I'm just saying that in that we need to perhaps look at these early hominids under a new light and maybe um, delve into you know, these tools that they create, we often think, oh, they were hunters or they were doing this. You know, they're almost always related to um, that type of activity, hunting activity. We rarely think of them building things. But in reality, why wouldn't they be building things? Because they need to build structures. And in this instance, they built this nice little wood plank connecting so that people didn't have to walk in a wet place that's essentially what this was this is like this little um is it a kind bridge of think of it or, in, or like yeah, a little walkway like like, a walk probably way. like through a wetland right where they have yeah, like those exactly okay pathways. Yeah. exactly exactly so think of it like that they're solving a problem because they don't want to fall down or get stuck in the mud or do something like that which again speaks to that higher cognitive ability um 
Okay, and so then the, you know, the big elephant in the room, it's half a million years old. And we know that this is true. There's no turning back. And like Jim said, on the front end of this call, things just keep getting older. And this is one of those things. <laughs> yeah, uh, half a, it's like 474,000. I mean, it's a pretty specific date they came up with. It's just mind blowing. And uh, yeah. I, I think the article goes on to say that the, the second oldest is something like half that, 200,000. So this is a exactly. real a real discovery, isn't it? And yeah, and 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 you know what what gets me is not only the building of Neanderthal, but um, was it in uh, it, it was in the Straits, wasn't it? Um, Straits of Gibraltar, where they found the flute, the Neanderthal flute. And here you yeah. go, here you go. You got a culture that was supposed to be the the big, <laughs> as Jen said, the dolts, and here they are building these structures and taking part in the arts and you know doing music and everything else boy that that sounds pretty modern to me <laughs> it does it does and i think when you think in terms of these older humans you know there's so much that gets lost when things are this old so much that gets lost really around these water areas yeah there's there's great um preservation for a lot of these yeah. items you know we're still putting together this massive puzzle of what we believe to be true of our ancestral evolution um with the caveat of you know we understand evolution very differently now so what does that mean to these earlier people and their accomplishments? I'm just not willing to always write it off as homo sapien because I don't think we were always the smartest kids on the block. Perhaps we were the most um, adaptable when bad catastrophic things happen and that's what pushed us to where we are now. Hmm. Uh, follow up on this one because uh, it has a lot of possibilities and I wonder if they keep digging what they're going to find, maybe some tools would be really cool. Like Absolutely. how old is the human story truly? Where do we get that defining moment where we even have characteristics mm -hmm. that are semi homo sapiens sapien, even its most primitive form. Now, where does that begin? And I think that mm -hmm. like Jen talking about this discovery in Africa, that helps us at least understand that timeline in a much more, in a, in a much clearer way. So we can start placing things and say, well, this is the furthest we can go, right? Well, now let's fill everything in between. And that's, yeah. I guess that's exactly. the, you got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. 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 That's, that's a good wow. one, Jen. Wow. All right. Let's move up the uh, the earth and talk with Matt about Lake Van in Turkey and uh, this wonderful discovery that you've made. I was looking at the video that you uh, post on your website. It's kind of a mind blower, Matt. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Jen, are you familiar with Lake Vaughn in eastern Turkey near the Armenian border at all? You I are. Am. Ah, are you familiar with the Urartian civilization at all? Yes. I am. And there's a there's a beautiful um settlement slash temple at the bottom of Lake Vaughn I was reading about when I heard we were gonna be on this together. Well, <laughs> we can go into that. Now I would like Cliff, if we could take this unique opportunity, having Jen on this, to be able to have her comments. And I'm hoping, Jen, that you can be very objective with me and scientific and not based on maybe predetermined um, conclusions because – we have some great photos that we can we can show as we discuss this. Um, I emailed you, Cliff, just now some while we're in this, and maybe you could pull those up while I'm talking, because there's a couple in particular that I want Jen to see, because I am very curious to see her reactions to them as I talk about this, having a, cr a credible archaeologist on site. Mm -hmm. So um, I, this is a long story, and I don't know necessarily how long – I have so I want to try to condense it into something that's easy to understand that hits the kind of key aspects of this and the Jen will appreciate it because even though I'm not an accredited archaeologist I like to play one at least in real life okay <laughs> um no shame so this, in that this all started with my obsession over the Sumerians Akkadians and Babylonians and even I guess the Assyrians that entire region of Mesopotamia was my obsession specifically though with the earlier Sumerian narratives of the original cities that are discussed and how 
there's a lot of myths and legends involved related to whether or not some of those ages are true, how far back some of them go. And if some of those stories are truly, truly far older than we're told and fits into a much older, uh, much larger time frame and timeline than, than we've been taught in school. Now, no fault to Jen. She is, she is part of an organization that does amazing work, but that organization of archaeology needs to be more willing to bend to evidence in terms of being open-minded rather than being skeptical because we're in an age now of new discoveries and new information. Oh, and yeah. I am not putting Jen down in any way because she's not part of any of these things and neither neither of the other, other archaeologists as well that are part of the projects. But there is a consensus here with these areas of Eastern Turkey near Armenia that I believe is incorrect and that we are potentially, with everything that we're about to discuss, could be a major factor with changing our timeline and understanding of history in the future. And that began with my obsession over the Sumerians, as I said. Now, in the ancient tablets, the some of the first tablets ever written that came out of Sumer from the Asher Banopal Library, mm -hmm. we have the Sumerian king list, we have the Uruk list of kings and sages, we have even the Brocious list, king list from uh, Babylon, and so on. And there's others as well, um, Legend of Atana, and we get into things like um, Eridu Genesis and others. But they all discuss how there's this last city created that was part of this event that came through that destroyed the old world and then everything was gone and then another rebuilding had to occur. But archeologists, mainstream archeologists were under that impression that it was a localized event that was based on flooding of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers in the springtime and not based on an actual catastrophic event. However, that is greatly changing as we're seeing new evidence emerge. And that began in when Sharupak, the last city talked about in the tablets, was considered a myth, was found in 1931 when the University of Philadelphia was out and they, they were doing these amazing excavations of what the city today is called Farah in Iraq. And when they were excavating down below, they had to go down through these different layers to try to understand the history of that area. And what they found was much more complex than they ever imagined. They found three distinctive layers of civilizations that have been in that region, but over an enormous time period. But it doesn't make any sense conventionally because as they're digging down from the top layer to the very bottom consensus stratum number three, which is at 30, 35 to 37 feet, they found that the top the top 17 feet, they found evidence of two civilizations that were that were had been in that area. Two civilizations. And that mm -hmm. those civilizations, they found no evidence of the name Sharupak, but they found primitive pottery, primitive tools, primitive work. It wasn't anything kind of it wasn't anything really sophisticated. And they almost gave up because they didn't find the excavate, they didn't find Sharupak, but they had a very strong evidence-based understanding that it was there. And so it was amazing reading these archaeologists from the papers of it because after they went down below 17, they went down below that layer of the two civilizations, they hit a void of just mud and, and sediment with no signs of human settlement for approximately 20 to 25 feet. Hmm. And when they hit that right below that layer, they're going to give up. And then they hit this layer at 30 to 33 feet down. They hit another layer that was completely different than anything above it. It was highly advanced, highly sophisticated culturally. They found pottery that was very sophisticated. They found ancient Sumer, they found tablets with cuneiform writing. And that's where they found the name Sharupak hmm. on those tablets. They found Sharupak. They found the original Sumerian city of Sharupak that was part of an age that if you read something like the Epic of Gilgamesh, you will find in that that he even tells, he tells Gilgamesh in that story that Sharupak is far more ancient than you could ever imagine. It's not mm. part of the same time period that we're from. So it's interesting reading the archaeologists about these discoveries and how they were speculating. They're like, isn't that interesting that there's this giant layer of mud and debris that seems that tends to coincide with this biblical flood narrative? And then here we find this more advanced civilization, the bottom instead of the top. And now, Jen, that doesn't make a lot of sense conventionally, does it? I mean, no, not at all. Um, it's really interesting you say that because... Um... In my experience, I work mostly in Jordan, so I have experience 
in that general vicinity. Um, yeah, I, I am not as familiar with Sharupak as I am, like, say, with Ur or, yeah. you know, maybe um, Nineveh or some of the other cities that have been discussed. But I do think that, um, you know, those early excavators, those early archaeologists and antiquarians had they weren't as maybe in the, or or how do I say this in rigid. a nice way? <laughs> they weren't as rigid <laughs> and they weren't as, you know, enamored with the ivory tower as it exists right, today. Right. And I'm probably going to be slapped silly for even saying such <laughs> a thing. You're going to get in trouble, But Jen. I'm saying it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but what I will say is um, we have found a lot of that. You know, we have... Well, we've reached the Neolithic layer, so let's stop excavating. There, right. I, I would be dishonest if I didn't say that that happened, because it does when you're excavating. When you find a lens of 25 feet that you no longer find cultural debris in, you have a tendency to stop excavating. And they almost so, did. Actually, yeah, a lot yeah. of people left the party, and only some of them stayed behind. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. About, about but no, but, no, but Jen, that's not the, the point. That's the, the critical point here, though, I need you to comment on is conventionally in school, if you were to go in school and learn about our history, the 6,000 year narrative of the Sumerians emerging as a civilization through the Egyptians and like through the whole history, right? How does it make sense though, in that narrative of being less developed and becoming more developed over time, how does it make sense to have a 35 foot layer and have primitive settlements at the top and then have advanced settlement at the very bottom? It's backwards, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've said this to Cliff numerous times. You won't find any disagreement from me. I mean, I think on the different segments that we've done over the years, I have consistently said Sumerians don't just show up and be a fully cooked culture. That just doesn't happen. And yeah. they don't just show up and, you know, have cuneiform writing and, you know, a, a, a system of um, counting the days, a calendar. They invented Clearly everything, didn't they? Like yeah. everything. They, and you know, they what... did. I mean, they were viewing the stars. Yeah. They were, they were doing it all. They had a, an intense system um, of not of reciprocity, but of altruism in the sense where everyone ate and, you know, everyone farmed yeah. and, was just complex culture, involved. complex laws, complex yeah. writing. Yes. They even had the first currency, the shekel, which yes. was based on the the amount of a bushel of wheat. They had all their systems in place that seemed to come out of nowhere. Yeah. And so Shurupak, yeah. they they speculated saying, well, it, this kind of lines up with the biblical narrative of a great flood and disaster. But then they went on to say that's purely speculation. And they like backtracked right. on their statement. But the point is that, Jen, that's lining up with a narrative that doesn't yeah. make sense. That's yeah. lining up with the narrative is saying that, look, this area of Sharupak, this area of Mesopotamia and Iraq has had multiple epochs of civilization that have come and gone there. And they're not all at the same level. You know, right. others, these levels we're seeing above them that have primitive pottery and primitive writing, they probably found and knew about the remnants of those ancient civilizations. And they just try to imitate it or do what they could. But we need to stop lumping all these groups together and imagine that these time frames of what's been there. And what's occurred is enormous. Yeah. We got to stop you know, putting in the lens of our understanding of just a few hundred years. We have to go thousands to potentially 10, 20,000. And that's what we'll get into in a second. Go ahead. Yeah, Jim. I, I was going to say, I'm I'm um, either blessed or cursed. I'm not sure which one sometimes with a, having a, a reverend in front of my name. And when you have a, <laughs> when you have a, when you have a reverend in front of your name and you go on a podcast, especially a Cliff Dunning podcast, podcast and you talk about uh, ancient civilizations uh, I was just inundated with uh with uh, comments about um the where is the Garden of Eden uh uh the Enuma Elish uh the Babylonian flood epic Gilgamesh and when I moved out here when I retired from ministry I moved out here to the woods about what 12 years ago I guess now Gobekli Tepe was was brand new. I mean, people were just starting. I mean, it just, it, it had been discovered earlier, but it was just starting to filter out in to the, the public yeah. consciousness. Yeah. And I'm just amazed in the last decade, um, everybody was saying, well, for instance, Gobekli Tepe can't be, uh, can't be that old because I mean, it, it can't spring that, that full blown onto the scene. Yeah. There has to be stuff. And then along came Karahan Tepe. 
and uh, and and people start looking about and and that whole complex now that whole thing you know pushing our civilization way back and way back and way back and i can't help but think 40 miles downstream from me uh, I'm, i live on the savannah river and 40 miles downstream from me is the topper site and uh, i could never mm. I'll, i i could never forget um when uh, when when they dug down for instance to the clovis level and uh, the the temptation was to stop don't go any farther because you know, heaven forbid you might waste yeah, money by if you find digging something, right? by yeah. digging in nothing yeah. but heaven forbid because even worse you might find something gobekli tepe is 12000 bc that's a long 11, time 6 ago. yeah yeah 11 mm -hmm. 6 right, right. Jen. what what yeah. what numbers are you going to throw at us right now because well, I'm curious. Yeah. Well, it's that's the whole point is that is that Gobekli Tepe gives us a benchmark. Okay. Right. And if Gobekli Tepe has the same T-shaped pillars that become a primary artifact from a relic of the civilization I'm about to talk about, you can say, well, it's older. It's an origin point. And Jen is going to be fascinated by this. And Jen and I might have to actually have a phone call later to see if she wants to be part of something pretty significant. Because I find Jen's in, uh, Jen's uh, ability to be objective about this with her credentials very interesting for this project. So I'd love to know your opinion, Jen, as we go further and talk about this. So hey. that well, everything I just said about Shurupak was simply just establishing the framework that there was an older Sumerian civilization that was ancient, 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 that's not the same as the primitive ones on top. And in that that ancient, ancient Sumerian civilization, you find out about the last priest and king in all these tablets that talks about as his name being Untapishtim or Zayasudra. Now, Zayasudra was his Sumerian name. Untapishtim was his Akkadian or Assyrian name. Now, that, that figure is critically important to history. I could not believe how deep this rabbit hole went as I went down this because my obsession over studying what happened to that story and that that king and priest and that whole narrative is what led me to Lake Vaughn. And I never imagined that this would happen. But remember, in the tablets, in the Atrahasis, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, you find out that there was an event created to destroy humanity. And we're going to call Untapishtim or Zayasudra Noah just so it's easy for everybody in the audience to understand, because he became the biblical figure of Noah, but it's much more ancient. And instead of that Russell Crowe depiction where he's got like a, a like a lion skin brown coat and he's like primitive, no, Untapishtim was a, a high priest and a king. He was sort of like Ashurbanipal, actually. He was very similar. So he was a very high profile, very intelligent um ancient king priest who had supposedly had a bloodline that was connected back to an ancient place and he was warned about a catastrophe okay that's what the stories describe about but the stories end and we never find out what happened because so many of these tablets fracture off they land in the area of mount ararat in this craft to survive this d disaster and I'm, i gotta move forward because there's a lot of stuff to talk about <laughs> but that Christian version, some might laugh at that in the archaeological world because their narratives are wrong. And it's, not, of course, not two of every animal. But there's a core to that that goes back to the Sumerian and the Syrian and Akkadian versions that is a different story, though. It's about pr pr protecting a bloodline. It's about protecting something. A, they call it the seed of life. They call it preserving the seed of life. And they it describes how they survive and they land in that Mount Ararat region. And then poof, it becomes a mystery. And you're like, what happened? Where'd they go? Right. And the Christian narratives talks about how they went off to different parts of the world and created all these things. But is there any archaeological proof that any of that's true? You know, there wasn't until now. And that right. that evidence has changed my entire life to the point now where I started my own company and we're doing we're we're about to leave for filming a massive film that's going to be exceeding half a million dollars that mm. perhaps Jen might want to be a part of to go to Lake Vaughan in Turkey to go to Ankara and then to link it with Bolivia and Peru about an origin point of a lost civilization and now let me get back to what that is in 2017 they discovered underwater ruins under Lake Vaughan right of megalithic temple yeah. walls, high precision, under more than 100 feet of water, under underwater there. And they were 
they were in press conferences and they were talking about they're like oh, that's kind of difficult to explain considering how far down that is in the lake and if you were to look at geologic records on how low the lake would have had to be to create that civilization it gets into some dangerous territory the number they came up with when the lowest maximum point for glaciation for that lake in terms of its water level being the lowest was fifteen thousand years ago 15 okay pushing it right then back earlier than gobekli tepe falling into that pre-younger driest narrative but i think it's not even that old i think it's older now and this is where the evidence i'm gonna we're gonna go with this is that that discovery got my attention, but it was only because I had seen the excavations that were being done at another site in the north part of Lake Vaughan called Zernaki Tepe. And I saw the same polygonal block design that you see in South America there that seems to come out of nowhere. When you, Jen knows that if you have a culturally advanced civilization that builds something, you see evidence of them around in a wide area. They lived there. It's not like you have this one spot and there's nothing ever anywhere around it that exists. You have to have some kind of evidence for a civilization that could have reached that kind of advanced stone masonry capabilities to build that. And that's what you have here is that the emergence of a mysterious lost civilization, I believe. And it started with this underwater ruins off of Adel Savez under Lake Vaughan. And then it, it blossomed from Zernaki Tepe to Kef Kalesi, Kef Temple, to Kavis Tepe, to the, the very core of it all, Ionis. I don't know if Jen knows about Ionis, but Ionis Temple is, in my opinion, I've looked at every megalithic temple, every high precision thing I can, I've seen in Egypt, Peru, Bolivia, Baalbek, Lebanon, through parts of Greece, through parts of Petra, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, I could go on, India. Ionis is some of the most beautiful, incredible stonemasonry, sophisticated work in the world. But not only that, but I believe it contains the very first cross, the very first images of the chalice, the first images of the tree of life, and the knowledge of the triptych doorways that ancient civilizations around the world were lowering on how to reach higher states of consciousness and divinity. I believe Lake Vaughn in the civilization I'm calling the Ararat civilization may be the missing link of when something happened that led to all these civilizations building all these incredible things and then disappearing from catastrophes and then other cultures not understanding what they did and trying to imitate it and then building right on top of them. And then we're confusing those younger civilizations with being the ones who built the older um, ones. Yeah. So you bring up some interesting points and, just even if you think of um, Lake Vaughn as the largest uh, lake in Turkey, it's also an endoeric mm -hmm. um, lake, which means it's a closed basin lake, which also means that it is a saltwater lake. Um, it, 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 you know, it um, condensates or uh, why, is it, why I've lost the word. Um, it loses a salt, so it's not yeah. as salty, but it's still a salty lake. Mm -hmm. So you have Lake Titicaca, which is very similar when you think very of similar. a lake in the middle of nowhere. Over a thousand also, feet deep too, each of them. Exactly, exactly. So there are a lot of really interesting correlations Super. that you bring up as I hear you talk about this. So It, it gets better, um, Jen. It gets better. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm thinking about the Ecuadorian images that come out that also – our replication you know they've got the handbag yeah, and the little yeah. bracelet yeah father crespi so. father crespi's artifacts yep okay exactly. so and and this is what i didn't really get to to sort of compile this so we can understand it is that the archaeologists that are making these excavations believe that this is part of the urartian civilization that was around a rough around four thousand years ago or so yeah. in this region but the stone masonry work and and the the ruins and the and the archaeological sites that you're going to see, they don't match at all. They don't match in even the slightest degree because yeah, the say. Europeans were building with brick and mortar, yeah. and they were actually a semi-war kind of a conquering civilization. And a lot of their iconography was based on more of like a conquering. And so archaeologists then took that mindset and tried to impose it onto these. And it's almost embarrassing, Jen. So the iconography that comes from these sites is bizarre. It's very Sumerian. It's the same types of imagery we see come out of that region from the Ashurbanipal Library and others that was gathered in that in that time period. And it shows the same wing depictions of ascension and all these things. But what's fascinating is that, and you brought up that, that the iconography from Ionis looks medieval almost. The cross that's at Ionis 
I believe was the first iteration of the cross ever on earth. And it was, it was, that's why it became such an important symbol. And the reason I say that is because that same cross at Ionis is then the becomes the red Knights Templar cross. And then the same cross that's shown in the Pope, as well as the British Royals, it becomes almost like the most sacred of all the crosses until Christianity changes it into a different version later. But the core of these, of these symbols, not only that, but we see the triptych doorways. We see um, this understanding of the balance of tree and life and the harmony that we have and the different sides and elements of us that became the Holy Trinity and Trinity in religion later. This time of year, uh, right at dusk, I always go out my front door every night out here in the woods and I see the Northern cross that's hanging up right uh, in the North, just on the horizon. And um, I began to think about this for the longest time. It's part of the course, the constellation Cygnus, the swan, but there's the Northern cross hanging up right up over our heads. Well, when I first came out here 12 years ago, 15 years ago, I found uh, a number of stone piles that were built out in the woods uh, around our place. And they're all up on the top of a little ridge. If it weren't for the woods, if the trees weren't there, if this was grassland like it used to be, you'd be able to see all, all of these different places. And I got a, a, a friend of mine who is a, uh, uh, has all the high-tech gizmo surveying equipment. He's a surveyor. He came out here and we, we uh, went to each of these places and he, he got a GPS reading on each of them. When we went back to his office and he put them out, he put them down, and uh, when he put them on a piece of paper, they looked so familiar where the GPS coordinates were over our map. So we shrunk down the size a little bit so it would um, co correspond to a sky chart that shows the Northern Cross, and they corresponded exactly. You could put the these stone piles around the woods on my place. You could put it down exactly over a Northern Cross um, sky chart and they wow. would match exactly pretty cool well when i saw that i said oh something's up here you know because i could just i could just see this people at at this time of year is when the cross was there so it would be the time of the winter solstice and they were all up on top of these ridge marks so if everybody were to build a fire on a certain night of the year the shortest the longest night of the year they would in effect bring heaven down to earth and uh you as above so below so when I was so fascinated about that, I wrote to uh, um, uh, Andrew Collins and I told him about this because he's such a, uh, you know, expert on, on Cygnus and Cygnus cults. And he wrote back to me within 20 minutes, I guess. And he said, is there a bird cult in your area uh, that might signify this? That I mean, now we're talking really ancient. Well, we're, of course, you're North right Carolina, right? South Carolina. South Carolina. But okay. right, right across the river from me, not 80 miles away, there is yeah. uh, the two great stone effigies that have been dated to four or 5,000 years ago. One is the uh, the the stone cross and uh, the, uh, the stone uh, eagle, and the other is the stone hawk. And right on my property, there is a pile of stones that is now spread out all over the place. And I've talked to all kinds of people about where these things may have came from. But if you walk around the edge of it, you can see that it marks exactly this, the idea of a, of a, a it's a bird cult, basically. Hmm. Make a long story. I've, I've written about it in some books. I won't go into it now because I know we're a little strapped on time. But to make that, that idea of the cross was obviously brought down to earth here in South Carolina and now Matt's talking about it in Lake Van, and Jen was talking about looking at the stars and seeing all these different things. It just is is amazing to me how long ago there was, there were people on the earth who were trying to bring these things down, bring the the heavens down to earth as above, so below, just everywhere. That synergy it seems to be critically important. And Jen yeah. mentioned yeah. there's so many comparisons to Lake Titicaca with Lake Vaughn that it's yeah. almost uncanny. They seem to have this intense interest in, interest in these giant naval-like lakes that are incredibly deep, surrounded by volcanoes. Mm -hmm. And both of those locations have that. Now, Jen, I emailed you the images from those locations just now. And I just want to summarize um, for Cliff, because I know we got to move on to Jim. But the, these ruins from around Lake Vaughan, from this civilization that I'm discussing, they're out of time and out of place. And I didn't mention this yet. I just got to briefly mention is that there are cuneiform writings at Cavus that specifically have the names King Hike and the bloodline descendants of Noah in the stone 
from being Japheth, from his son of Noah, showing that the actual story was true and that those legends were actually based on an original story of the last Sumerian king. I mean, that's like a movie, right? The last Sumerian king <laughs> of all time. I like that had, title. Who had three sons who they survived a catastrophe and they were given knowledge on how to rebuild the new world. And I oh, believe that that, that civilization there with the first cross and the ascension teachings that are incorporated with it, then spread around the world with the, with the knowledge of megalithic building because the Sumerians built with brick. So they didn't have anything to do with that. And so we see something that comes out of nowhere with these giant basalt stones that are built as well as andesite. Jen might know andesite is a seven on the most hardness scale yeah. with basalt mm -hmm. being a six to a six and a half. That Ionis temple with the first cross is built at an andesite with the primitive brick and mortar almost like eroded almost completely on top from the Urartians that had nothing to do with it. Um, but clearly they found that civilization and they built and honored it in their temple. But the point is that thou, those teachings, I believe, and the teachings of megalithic building and, and reaching these incredible states and the teachings of consciousness through all these ascension teachings then traveled around to South America with Bolivia, with Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, because there you see the same cross, the same triptych doorway there. You see the same, um, the Chicana symbol, which became the, the, the ziggurat step pyramid, but combined with the as above, so below versions. It's wild. Jen, check out that email. You can like, nerd out on those images when you get a chance. Um, but it's just amazing. The implications here could be, enormous and so just right. to end out before we move on cliff is just to say that this has got the attention of people already around the world and i'm already it's, i'm leading up a, a very significant film project with some big directors and producers in hollywood with, along with experts such as billy carson biblical expert paul wallace and megalithic expert brian forster to go to lake farm with these locations to go to ankara where there's an artifact at a basement there that doesn't nobody wants to know about or yeah. is hidden there. And then all across the world to Tiwanaku and Pumapunku to show the same symbols, same stone, same comparison to show there was a story, an origin point of knowledge that passed around the world and became the core of a, of a mystery that we're trying to figure out. And that mystery seems to lead back to Lake Vaughn and this lost era of civilization. You know, we talk about uh, how we create our own reality, and it's still yeah. a concept. Well, Kreb, so yeah, a Fred Fred Hoyle. Yeah, um, he was he, he was able to do something that even Albert Einstein wasn't able to do. When Einstein first came across quantum reality, he didn't believe in it. Uh, you know, he he didn't hold believe in this whole idea of uh, and of consciousness, human consciousness, or any kind of consciousness, actually creating the right reality in which it lives. And, you know, his famous comment, Einstein's famous comment was, you mean if, if you know, the moon disappears, if I'm not looking at it, you know, and, but, but you know, Fred Hoyle saw beyond that. And, and he was the one that first began to see that uh, it, it, it just could be that we are much more involved in the creation of our reality than we think we are. And we always, we always look, tend to look at reality as being a stage, an empty stage. It would be there whether we were here or not. But now uh, Fred Hoyle came along and said, maybe not. Maybe we are creating the stage. Um, you know, the old thing about if a tree falls in the forest, is there any sound? Well, now the question is, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to see it, Maybe there was no tree, you know, that kind of thing. Um, he didn't see reality as a stage upon which we enter. Uh, he didn't believe in, in the concept of what is called emergence. He didn't believe that consciousness emerged into reality. Uh, he believed that consciousness came first. In other words, consciousness could very well be the ground of our being, the source from which we all come. And if that's the case, it opens up all kinds of questions. You know, why are we here on Earth? Maybe we're here to experience. Uh, maybe we're here to give consciousness for the first time eyes, physical eyes and physical ears and 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 senses and everything else to experience. Um, I find that very comforting in a very practical way when life is very difficult and I'm having a hard time making ends meet or looking around and seeing what's going out there and life is tough. I find it very comforting to think that, well, 
maybe that's one of the reasons I came here to experience that very thing. And uh, I am giving consciousness and experience in a material reality that it could not have without me and without the other billions of people who are here on the earth. Uh, it, it to me, it just opens up the whole thing. And as a as a you know systematic theologian, my whole life, it opens up my whole concept of what what God could mean. Uh, the idea of uh, consciousness, the idea of uh, greater reality, the ground of our being, the source that mystical source that we can probably never really understand. But I got a sneaking suspicion that the old timers, the real ancients that Jen was talking about and that Matt was talking about, I've got a sneaking suspicion that they intuited this and created their own uh, spiritual framework because probably living in a different kind of world than, than we are, it wasn't as noisy, it wasn't as chaotic, it wasn't as confusing, they probably had more time to contemplate and to meditate the, on, on these things. It was something that I never knew was that important until I retired and basically came out here to live in the woods for one year, uh, 12 years ago, and uh, it just entered into a 12-year meditation, and it, it's just getting bigger all, all the time. I, I, and that's, I think, what it takes, and I think probably the old-timers, well, maybe they were better at it than we were. Wow. Hey, Jen, Matt, Jim, fantastic. Thanks for joining me.